Hello and welcome to Your Money or Call. I'm Kim Slater. If you have a question about shares, our phone lines are open on 1300 30 34 35. Or if you prefer, you can email us at yourmoney at skynews.com.au. So, welcome to the program. Tonight I'm joined by Russell Muldoon from the Montgomery Fund and Michael Kadari from Kadari Securities. Guys, welcome to the uh, welcome to the program. Rather interesting day in the market. Um, ASX pushed through 4,500 points. We had uh, some good news out of the uh, out of the Telstra AGM. We had some good news out of the CSL AGM. And uh, so, you know, defensives look like they're on the path to path to growth. But interestingly, um, tomorrow we've got the Chinese GDP figures coming up. Now, you know, what seems to be happening is we're starting to see some more row row come into the market, mm. risk on, risk off. Or more risk on than anything else, and the resource sector seems to be uh, seems to be, you know, getting getting that flow of funds, and uh, that we've got the market, uh, the S and P up there. But we might just uh, flash to that graph on that uh, on that GDP figures or on that GDP graph for well, China. This is an interesting question for you, Russell, because obviously what's going to happen is that this type of market is going to favour the incumbents that are low cost producers that are going to be able to produce cash. Mm. Now, you know, it would be interesting to see what your model is, is, is saying about Fortescue, Rio and BHP. I mean, are they at a point where you're saying their value? Um, well, uh, viewers that have been watching us for, for a long, long time know that we really don't invest in commodity companies. They're businesses that don't control their pricing. They, uh, the, probably the only thing they can control is their production. Um, but they don't control the, the demand for their product, the pricing for their product. And we prefer business with pricing power and businesses that can expand into their market. And I think a really in, uh, interesting way to look at China is to, to think of China as a business. Now, as a business, its two largest customers are the US and Europe. Now, uh, the US at the moment is, is very slow in terms of its growth, and, uh, and China, and sorry, and, and Europe is actually what, it, what appears to be contracting. So you've got two of its largest customers, which are demanding less from China in terms of products. So what Kim was talking about before, where they have to uh, urbanise their, their demand from internally to, to stabilise their GDP, that's a natural course for, for this country, who around 60 to 70 per cent of its GDP in the past has been fixed investment growth. So look, it, the transition from a, a fixed investment growth uh, country to uh, a country that's driven by the consumer is not a smooth one. So I think we can expect a, a very, very bumpy ride. And if you are an investor in commodities, just expect it to be bumpy over the long term. Quick look at BHP and yeah. analysts seem to be forecast around the 16 to, to 17 billion in NPAT. Yep. US earnings translated into, into Aussie. It's trading for about 180 billion market cap, so it's trading on 10 times. So what the market's basically saying is there's no growth in, in earnings power for this business for the next couple of years because you know, the markets are slow for them. Um, and we have a valuation of around the, the 31, 32 dollar mark, so it's not too far from where they're trading at the moment. All right, well, we'll move on to our first caller, who's uh, Tom from New South Wales. Welcome to the program, Tom. Thank you very much, Kim. How are you going today? Oh, not too bad. We're, uh, we're we're struggling on. It's good to it's good to be working once in a rising market rather than a falling market. That's exactly right. Well, what can we what can what can we do for you with uh, expert advice tonight, Tom? Well, look, um, I've been following the show quite a bit of late, and I was just interested in the current market climate. What would be a strong strategy to invest with? Well, would you like to just just repeat that again? Oh, the question was: Look, in the current market climate, what would be a strong strategy to invest with? I mean, I've been looking at a lot of gold producers over the last few months, and I just wanted to know what the, the, the panel thought of it. So, investment strategies, Russell. You know, in a market like this, is at 4,500. Everything looks expensive. Defensives look expensive. Resources look cheap. Where do you, you know, where do you, where, where do you actually where do you actually go for? A, a category, a category investment. Mm. Oh, I absolutely agree with Michael when he mentioned quality businesses. I think quality should be the first thing you consider about before you you, you, you think about buying a business. Always buy quality, always buy quality when it's trading a fair value. But we have a significant part of our portfolio invested in healthcare, you know, the likes of CSL, your Cochleas, your Certex Medicals, your Ansels, uh, your Ramsey Healthcares. They're fantastic businesses. The share price, total share price returns over the last year have averaged 30 40 percent. In terms of uh, Certex, it's averaged, I think, at the total share return for the last 12 months has been 115%. Um, fantastic businesses. Uh, healthcare has, gener uh, has, has bred more uh, global franchises than any other sector in, in, in Australia. Um, so we, we focus a lot of our attention there. And we also focus a lot of attention on internet businesses, so your realestate.com.au's, your car sales, your web jets, your flight centres, um, businesses which have very, very uh, good structural tailwinds behind them. 
uh, I think they were the two standout sectors in the reporting season that just come and they make up a significant part of our portfolios. In terms of gold, um, we do own two gold stocks. In the private fund, we own uh, Silver Lake Resources. And in the, the new retail fund, we own uh, Medusa Mining and Silver Lake Resources. Now, the reason we own those two is uh, those, both of those businesses uh, have uh, a, a production profile that's drastically st stepping up over the next few years. So Silver Lake current produces around 100,000 ounces. It's going to 200, it's going to 300, it's going to 400. Medusa has a very, very similar production profile. So if gold stays where it is, these businesses are going to be selling at very, very high margins and it's going to be producing a significant amount more. And they have, uh, they have the reserves to support mine lives in excess of 10 years. Um, so look, I don't follow Regis. I know it's done very, very well and a lot of fund managers own it. Um, but we own Silver Lake and, and Medusa. Okay, well, look, um, coming back to um, CSL, which has you know, had, had its AGM today, we, we're seeing that, uh, well, the company's announced it's doing a buyback of another 900 million shares over the next, over the next 12 months, and uh, that is going to be, uh, be EPS accretive. Um, at what price does CSL start to look too expensive? I mean, it's had a fantastic run up there. It's in the high 40s at the moment. I've seen some price targets at the low 50s, you know, 51, 52 dollars. But um, you know, has it? Uh, well, when, when, when's it? Go, when's the share price going to outstrip the, uh, the growth rate of the uh, the company? Yeah, I think that's right. I think around the, the the low 50 marks is where fair value for this business is. But saying that, it is a very, very high quality business. I think it's our third largest holding in the Montgomery Private Fund at the moment. Um, and we're not looking at selling at all. We'll probably only ever consider selling this or a cochlear when the shares trade at a 30, 40% premium to what we think are worth. Now, the reason for that is because it is such a high quality business, um, it's very, very hard to replace these companies. So if you do sell, uh, we have to find an equal or better company to replace it with. And there's just not that many of these businesses around in the Australian market. Um, so we're a long-term holder of this business. Um, if it went to 70 or $80, we may consider it on, on today's fundamentals, but we're definitely a long-term holder. Okay, we'll move on to our next caller, who's uh, Robert from New South Wales. Welcome to the program, Robert. Uh, hi, panel. Look, I wonder if you guys can tell me what's going on with FKP Property Group. All it seems to be doing of late is just making new lows every day. I think this is about its 19-year low today. It hit 21.5 cents. I thought it was bad when it was in the 30s a couple of months ago. And there just seems to be no end in sight. I think one of the hedge funds just keeps on dumping millions of shares every day. And today, like it looked like it was going to try to go up to 23, and then all of a sudden there was about 8 million shares unloaded after lunch, and they fell to 21.5. Well, eight and a half million shares trading. It sounds like a fair amount of fair amount of volume. Have you come? Have you seen anything? Is there anything there that suggests to you that there's any corporate action or any you know large shareholders cutting and running? Them? Oh no, I haven't seen anything, okay. uh, Kim. No, oh. but, uh, look, this is a, a business which we talked about a couple of sectors that are performing very strongly: uh, healthcare and and internet. Um, residential construction is, is a very tough market at the moment. We rank every company down from A1 down to C5. This business gets a C5 ranking and it's we're valued around 20 cents. Now whether or not you'd value a C5 is, is another matter. It's just not a business that's on our radar. Okay, well we're going to take a uh, quick break, but before that, uh, Russell, we're going to put you on the, stop, stop, on the spot, I should say, because it's time for the stopwatch and your time starts now. Okay, so uh, we're watching Breville Group. The share code is BRG. It's a business that we have a significant holding in both the Montgomery Fund and the Montgomery Private Fund on behalf of our clients because we see the business has very, very bright prospects for the next three years. Um, they're currently selling 50 of their 300 products into the US market. Ten and seconds. as they expand that uh, over the next couple of years, we see a significant increase in earnings, profitability, and what we think the business is worth. Our clients hold it, and we think it's one you should watch. Good. Tom's our first caller after the break. Welcome to the program, Tom. How's it going? Um, Good. Just a question on your thoughts about um, Codan. They've um, come out with strong interim net profit um, results today and an increased dividend. Just wondering if it's a uh, good time to buy. Just your thoughts on that? Well, judging by that uh, share price graph, that is a that's a decent de decent run. Russell, you, you you you're an expert on this thing. What uh, what does it what does it do, and why is the share price? up at these levels and would you buy it at these prices? 
Okay, um, so Kodan is actually the largest holding that we have in the retail fund. So our fund did very, very well today. I mean, the, the entire market did well. It was up about 0.8. But our fund was up about 1.5% on the back of this being the largest position in, uh, in our portfolio. So we were very, very, very happy today. Um, Kodan in the main sells metal detectors. So with a, with a rising gold price and uh, the business selling more metal detectors in more regions throughout the world, it's just announced a 40% upgrade to its earnings over uh, 2012 uh, full year results. So we think that's a fantastic result. Um, uh, would we buy it today? Um, look, we, we do think that the shares are cheap. Um, we do think this is a business with uh, bright prospects. Now, um, uh, if, if you remember a Scaffold, our online application, we actually flagged this as a business back in, in June as, as one to watch. So if you've, if you've been following us for a long, long time, you would have been a shareholder in this business. It's our largest holding and uh, you know, our shareholders are very, very happy it's today. It's really important if you're going to look at debt levels, then you also look at the cash generation of the business, the underlying cash flow. This business generated, uh, say, a reported $30 million in net profits last year, but generated $40 million in, in cash flow. Invested about 12, so its free cash flow was running about 30 million. So even though it's running a 40, 50% debt on equity, it has a significant amount of free cash to be able to pay off its interest. It's really not an interest for uh, an issue for a business of this quality, and uh, the earnings of, of, of such, you know, they're, they're very, very sustainable. So look, I don't think that's an issue with Kodak. The interesting thing about stocks like this is that they are a bit of a lobster pot. You know, I mean, you can get into them, and I mean, they do, then they do run, and then well. The question is, how the hell do you get out of them in a you know in a in a, in a timely fashion without mm -hmm. slamming the uh, slamming the share price? So, mm -hmm. I think that's always something to consider too. Is the yeah. is the, the underlying the, the, under, yeah. the underlying liquidity yeah. of the stock? Yeah, that's a, that's an important rule that we have is liquidity. So we we factor that in before we build a portfolio position. Um, so if the, the liquidity is low, we'll we'll build a very very low in that low position in that company. So if we do need to get out, we can get out in a hurry. Um, so absolutely, I think from a risk management perspective and a portfolio management perspective, it's, it's vital. Next caller is uh, John from John from WA. Welcome to the program, John. Yeah, how you going, fellas? Um, look, I just wanted to ask the panel what they thought about um, uh, QBE. Um, mm. This has gone up uh, from about 13.10, 13, 10 or 13.15 13, from Monday. It's finished about 14.10 14, today. Um, got a history of dividends, obviously the better... Uh, not, not, not real flash over the last couple of years, but they've got a history of paying dividends and, 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 and probably increasing their profits with lower interest rates over the next couple of years. Where do you see it over the next sort of 18 months, sort of uh, comparing it to term deposits as they're sort of coming down? Yeah, well, that's, a, that, that's an interesting question. QBE comparing it to term deposits. Well, we know which way term deposits are going. Interest rates are going, going lower, but for my money, I would have thought this running QBE could... Um, Probably take it somewhere towards the you know fifteen sixteen dollar level. What are your thoughts, Russell? Um, we're not a, a shareholder in, in QBE, and it's for a reason. The, re the main reason is this business was a business that grew very very heavily from by acquisition from two thousand and two two thousand and seven, and it really delivered on on that strategy over the, those years. But as as with most businesses, as they, as they mature and they start digesting so many uh, different insurance companies. Um, what we're seeing is, is, is return on equity collapse for this company, um, and, 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 and such the, the business valuation has also collapsed. Um, so look, the, the business had a very good dividend yield in 2007 when we thought the shares were worth about $32. Um, business has a very good dividend yield today, but we think they're worth about 13. You know, would you buy? You know, on your theory, would you buy back in 2007 at 32 for a good dividend yield only to hold it today at? Thirteen or fourteen dollars for a good dividend yield, and having all that capital loss, um, I just think that's a bit, very risky strategy. Just focus on the business, um, and if it does well, the share price will go up in line with the business's growth. And as a business uh, generates more profit, earns more cash flow, they can pay more dividends to you. Um, I think that's a much better strategy. Than, well, we're going to uh, take an email, not the one that's going to come onto the screen, but uh, the one that I'm going to read out. And this one is from Brad. Um, Brad uh, asks or says that he's currently heavily invested in NAB and Westpac and he's just wondering when to sell and reinvest it all. Also medium, what our medium view uh, terms or medium term view is on IFL. Interesting question because we've got the banks reporting next week and we've been obviously talking on this program about you know, relative valuations and for my money Westpac's the most expensive of all the banks and uh, I think it's very close to very close to a sell, and possibly we are going to see some ex-dividend um, rotation out of things like uh, Westpac into into ANZ. But if you were holding 
in Brad's case, NAB and Westpac, is it, uh, is it is it time to is it time to take some off the top? Okay, Russell, we'll come to we'll come to you again. You know, the, the banks um, thoughts are you know I mean obviously you've got a valuation model. What's your valuation model saying about the banks and uh, NAB and Westpac? You know the ones, the, the the ones, the ones to be in. Sure, I, I agree with you in terms of valuation. I do think the banks are probably a little bit expensive, and I, I read an interesting article on the weekend. The the total market cap capitalisation of Australian banks is more than all the banks put together in the entire eurozone. So <laughs> that should give you a, a pretty good uh, feel for. We we're just going to show you how bad the euro is. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's a lot of capital holes that need to plug, and they probably do capital raisings, and, and our banks are very, very healthy. Michael said they're AAA rated, which, which they are. Um, Westpac, I agree with you. Uh, I think it's uh, it's quite expensive. Um, if I can just bring up my my model here, just bear with me for two seconds. Uh, we we think it's worth around the $23 mark, trading at 26, and for for NAB. Um, we have we have around the twenty five twenty six dollars so basically where they're trading at the moment Look, if you hold the banks at the moment there's been a lot of uh, questions being asked about their growth prospects in terms of loan growth credit growth uh, the the wealth management divisions their insurance divisions all those uh, questions are going to be answered next week when they release their reports so I'll wait uh, digest all the all the announcements is it digest what the company is saying what management is saying and I think make a decision for you <laughs> okay well the other sector which 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 looks very interesting at the moment which we're starting to see some outperformance Performance on, and we'll go to our next caller, Andrew, in just a sec. But very quickly, is funds management? We, you know, we saw the price of AMP start to break out on the upside today, and you know, this looks like some, some good value there in um, in that sector. You've got Henderson Perpetual, um, BT Investment Management. Have you um, have you run your, run your eye over those in terms of in terms of value, Russell? And is there anything there that pops out that says to you that's a buy? Uh, I think as a as a fund manager, we don't necessarily invest in other fund managers. Um, but look, these things are, are market beasts. Um, they have a very, very fixed line of, of costs, um, and, and any any out, out performance of the market um, in, in terms of their fund growth. So, say their fund growth is 10%, their fixed lines stay the same. So, a lot of the profits just drop to the bottom line. So, when the market rises, you, you'll find that these stocks get a get a re-rating as their fund grows and their and their fee income improves. Um, we we think there's um, uh, some very, very uh, heavy structural uh, headwinds against, uh, and a lot of outflows, a lot of people going into uh, fixed investments away from equity market products. We're seeing that with Platinum. Platinum's funds come down from 25 billion to, I think, 15, 16 billion today. Um, those terminal declines are, are not the, the sort of the, the bright prospects in businesses that we look for. We look for businesses with, with markets that are growing and businesses that are growing. Um, so look, it's, just not, it's not a sector that we're interested right, in. Our next caller is um, Andrew from Queensland. Welcome to the program, Andrew. Well, thanks, Tim. I just, I just wanted to get the panel thoughts on ALS, uh, former Campbell Brothers. Yep. I bought not long ago um, when it went down around the $8 mark. It closed up over 10 today. Just wondering whether it's time to pull a few bucks out, take a bit of profit or hold on. Is it going higher? Thanks, Tim. Good, good, good question, the old Campbell Brothers, because it got it got it got slaughtered when everything else got slaughtered with the uh, slaughtered with the resource. Uh, yeah, resource yeah, Russell, I was going to say, step into the breach while uh, while Michael Michael gets um, gets back on his horse. But um, you know, at these sorts of prices with uh, with with ALS, mm. what are you th what are your thoughts on it? Oh, I look, and congratulations to Andrew for, for buying it so cheaply. It's a it's a passive, uh, classic uh, value investor strategy to, to buy when the business is. Uh, get thrown out with, with the bathwater. This is probably one of the best in the mining service space. Um, we're still a little bit cautious on, on mining services. So 50% uh, of this business earnings comes from minerals testing, um, and a significant amount of that comes from exploration, greenfield, uh, greenfield, and brownfield work from from miners. So you have to have a view on that if you're if you're a long term owner in, in the business. Um, if you're just trading on, on on share prices, which which we don't do, we have around the uh, nine to, to ten dollar mark in in forecast years. Um, so it's currently kind of trading a little bit. Well, what gives me a lot of hope for this stock is that, as you say, it generates 50% of its revenue from the resources sector. Is that, you know, as you see a tail off in like iron ore um, exploration, you're seeing that slack taken up more by gold exploration, for mm. instance. So, you know, it's one of these it's one of these businesses to a certain extent, which is, you know, if you if you want a better description, a slightly recession proof as far as the, as far as the resource sector is concerned, as long as 
the music doesn't stop altogether. Mm. And that's, mm. you, know, I, you know, I think the share price the could possibly get, you know, back to around that 11 or $12 level. Great Australian company, has expanded, you know, very, very well, done very, very smart acquisitions overseas. Yeah. I agree with you. If you can own... You, you want to own quality businesses, and in the mining services space, this is one of the highest quality. All right, well, we'll move on to our next caller, uh, which is uh, well, who is Greg from Victoria. Welcome to the program, Greg. Thanks, Kim. Thanks for taking my call. Not a problem. Uh, I'd just like to ask a question about Prima Biomed, PRR. Um, this week they announced some positive results from interim tests for their for this CVAC vaccine uh, for ovarian cancer, and they dropped about 20%. I'd just like their panel's uh, view on the um, if it's a long-term hold or to get out now. Thanks. Bi biotech stocks always fraught with, uh, fraught with danger. Okay, uh, Russell, I don't think you've got anything to add there, have you? Uh, look, I think if you're, you know, again, focus on quality, you know, that should be your number one goal when you're, you're building your own portfolio. Um, you want to have a business that generates earnings, has a, a stable history of generating earnings. Um, and if you, you know, we're interested more in, in Surtex, I'm not sure if you've heard of Surtex, it, it produces uh, uh, urethium uh, beads which get injected through the groin up the thermal, thermal artery into the liver and uh, it's, uh, it, it helps um, reduce uh, liver tumours down to a size where they can be resected. Um, that business is growing very, very well. It's had 33 quarters of consecutive growth. It has that track record behind it. You have confidence that the business is going to grow in the future. Premium Biomed, they, they may come out with a good announcement today, a good announcement tomorrow, but you're really buying a story. There is no earnings in this business. I, I just think this is more of a speculative event. OK, well, that's, that's very true. And it's, it's been, been a stock that's been asked about uh, just about every second week on your money, your call. So uh, I, think every, uh, <laughs> I think every, everybody has a different view of what it's, uh, what it's worth. Our next call is John from Victoria. Welcome to the program, John. Hi, thanks uh, for having the call. Um, I bought Rio at eighty-two dollars, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering whether what you thought on the strategy of buying more at this lower price to average out the price. Well, bought Rio at eighty-two. Bought Rio at eighty-two dollars. Um, strategy of buying, buying, buying more to average the uh, average, average the price price down you'd have to be reasonably confident as I am that the you know that you can make money out of Rio at these sorts of prices and to my my way of thinking Rio around 55 56 dollars does look cheap and I think it could possibly run back up into the uh, back up into the low 60s but um, your thoughts uh, Russell do you really want to go to me on an iron ore oh, producer? Oh, yeah. Well, look, you can, we'll give you 30 seconds. Oh, uh, look, um, you we... You fill, fill and kill it. <laughs> we have a valuation on, on Rio around the $52 to $56 mark. I think it's trading around the $55, probably trading at fair value. Um, given the, like I said, it's a, it's a commodity producer. It doesn't have any pricing power. It's capital intensive. Um, it's just really not a sector that we focus on, uh, on, well, on John. The... Um, yeah, I just, I just think there's better quality companies yeah, out there. Yeah, we'll want to kick off with an email. Jeff asks, I'm interested in the planet's thoughts on CTP. They've recently done a farming deal with Santos. So what he wants to know is what are the implications of this farming deal and is it a good this deal? one, Bernie? No, no, I'm, no, I'm looking at it right now and it, and it looks like okay, uh, it's we'll nothing move. that I understand. Okay, well, we'll, move, we'll, move, we'll move on there. Okay. Our next caller is uh, Will from Victoria. Welcome, Welcome to the program, program. Will. Thank you. I'm inquiring uh, as to what the gossip on the boss is concerning Linus. I know there's a court case uh, or a decision from a court uh, pending uh, early November, but the, pro mar the market's been dropping quite significantly over the last uh, week. I'm just wondering what, um, what your panellists have heard. Russ, uh, you know, we've, uh, I, think, I think we've um, touched base on this one before, so it's probably, a bit, it's probably a bit pointless to go any further, isn't it? Unless you've got some... Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, probably best uh, that we move on. I mean, yeah. this, this company is, is rated right at the end of, of our rating scale at a C5. Um, I can see analysts uh, are forecasting the business actually to finally come into production well, in 2014, 2015, after years and years of trying to get I this. I think the this. whole thing about this is it's got to get over the political risk before it can actually get into rare earth production. And then the question is... Where is, where is the price? Of, what, what is the price of rare is going to be when it's in, in production? So and I think China's been manipulating that price a fair bit. Correct. Of, you know, correct. So, okay. Yeah, a lot of risk. All right. Um, 
Our next caller is uh, Anthony from New South Wales. Welcome to the program, Anthony. Oh, thanks very much, panel. Um, I've got uh, two uh, entities I'd like to ask about. One is uh, very different. One is uh, Mesoblast, MSB, in yep. the biotech sector. Have you also uh, looked, at, uh, looked at Mesos at all? Oh, I was just having a look at Meso, and it, it's, mm. um, they, they seem to culture and, and scale up adult, adult stem cells. I mean, I'm not quite sure what that means. It's, it's I don't come from a biotechnology background. Um, look, the, the business is, is yet to make any money. Um, but again, analysts are forecasting uh, that to happen in the next two or three years. Um, but where the share price is trading at $6.60, I think there's a lot of enthusiasm built into the stock at the moment. Uh, based on the analyst forecast in 2015, so this is 2015 when cash flows are starting to blow, they've got an earnings per share forecast of around 11 cents. So that puts it on a, a PE of <laughs> well, you know, 60, 62 good. times. Uh, hey, it's, it, I think there's a lot of enthusiasm built in this. Whether or not that's uh, from a, a corporate activity, uh, a takeover, speculation of something happening, or whether or not they actually have some IP there that's extremely valuable. But there, there's something that's keeping the share price up there. The share price has been there for a long, long time. Um, you know, the, it's up to the business now to, to come to fruition. Yeah, well, I think I think some of the, I think some of the, the, the you know the biotech analysts like uh, Stuart Roberts that. Um, Bill Potter have got uh, price targets on this about 10, 11 bucks a share. So, you know, the, 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 what they're saying is it's you know they're getting into phase three. They've done joint ventures. They've they're um, you know got a uh, couple hundred million bucks of cash on the cash on the balance sheet. Mm. So, if uh, well, there's, you know, if they're spending that money on that phase three trial and they've recruited that trial and they've got five, six hundred patients, so it's a it's a significant trial. Um, you know, I, I'd watch the outcome of those results like a hawk. Well, yeah, exactly. And I think that's what the market's doing. But uh, come back to computer share. Any 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 quick thoughts on that one? Uh, it's a, it's not one that's come up on our radar simply because it's a little bit expensive at the moment. Okay. Um, you know, this business really does well when there's a lot of market activity, there's a lot of turnover on share registers, there's a lot of trading. We've seen volumes collapse in the last few years from six billion uh, per day in the Australian market down to about three. Um, you know, these guys make a lot of money when people trade and they have to hand out a lot of certificates or there's a lot of capital raisings, there's a lot of new people that come onto share registers. Um, you know, also their free float, uh, which they, they get from holding money from, from companies, they're earning very, very low rates of interest. So look, the cycle will turn for them, um, market activity will pick up and if this rally continues then a lot of people are going to be a bit more interested in investing and, and buying shares um, and all that's needed then is, is for interest rates to turn. But if interest rates did turn in the US or, or Europe, you know, I think the governments would be in a lot of trouble. So uh, I can't see that happening for, for a okay. while. Okay, we'll move, we'll move on because we don't have much time left in the program. Um, Leslie has uh, sent in via email. She's wondering if she could have the experts' technical and fundamental view on new standard energy. So this is a stock that um, is uh, is drilling in the uh, drilling in the Canning Basin, but for both conventional and unconventional gas and oil and well, hydrocarbons has had uh, has had one um, uh, intersection of hydrocarbons. I think at about around about three four hundred metres the uh, last week, and, we're and I think the company is due to. Um, report uh, further drilling results to the market tomorrow. It, so. It's definitely at the, the, the speculative end of the market. I mean, these, these sort of businesses have a certain pot of cash. They go out there and they, they drill a lot of uh, holes in the ground. They turn into Swiss cheese. They, they hopefully uh, find something, uh, some sort of resource, oil, uh, natural gas, which they can then produce, sell, make cash flow, then move on and, and find other wells. Um, an interesting business uh, that, that operates in this, a similar sort of space is Sundance Energy, does it in, in the United States. Um, it's, it, it buys tenements, and it makes Swiss cheese out of them, drills a lot of holes, um, increases the value of those tenements by, by finding a, a few reserves, and then flips those assets. Now, this business has been able to generate 70 and 80% IRRs over a three year holding period on some of its tenements. I mean, just an amazing business. I don't, I don't know why people are willing to pay those sort of prices. For, well, my, for the assets, my, my, my tip to you is if you believe that, you should be buying some new standard energy then. Okay, okay. Is, is that the goal? Think, so well, think, they're basically think, listed private equity plans. Well, it's, it, it's actually got some very attractive ground up in the Canning Basin, and that's, you know, that, 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 is, that, that is the new area. And as I say, they had a, they had a hydrocarbon column there of about, oh, it was about 300 odd metres. Mm. But, uh, you know, it's, it's subject to testing and everything, and uh, they're drilling deeper into the, into, the, into the well with the expectation that um, below 3,000 metres they're going to find more hydrocarbons. So mm. the proof will be in the pudding when they announce it. Um, and I think we've got uh, time for one last email, and uh, this last email is from David. He is asking, and you know, you guys can go out on a high note on this one, is what's the panel's panel's view on where the 
where the ASX 200 um, will be by the end of the right. year. Um, you've got five seconds. Do you want to put a, put a figure on it, or do you want to uh, we'll, 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 we'll leave it for leave it for another time? No, maybe leave it for another day. Look, we, we think it's worth about 4,200, so it's okay. downside. From here. All right, that's all we have time for today on the program. So thanks very much to our guests, Russell Muldoon from the Montgomery Fund and Michael Kadari from Kadari Securities. And to you, all our viewers, for all your calls and emails. Thank you. Until next time, I'm Kim Slater.